If I said Medellin, Colombia, what do you think of? Pre-2015, only a handful of people would have given the answer that's commonplace today. But since that narco show was on TV, almost everyone knows what Medellin is famous for now, and that's for being the home of the Medellin cartel, headed up by the one and only Pablo Escobar. These days, that cartel is confined to the history books, but the legacy of their violence lives on in the city, and the countless problems didn't exactly die along with Escobar when the law caught up with them back in 93. It's there in that city that I met a girl named Stephanie while I was traveling around South America. Steph was from Canada, on a similar sort of rolling vacation as I was. There was almost this instant chemistry between us that ended with me asking her out. We drank cheap Colombian beers, compared traveling tattoos, she definitely won with her traditional tippy-tap Filipino tribal piece, and generally just had ourselves a great time. When it came to the end of the night, though, we were put in a rather precarious position. You see, the old legacy of violence and suspicion means that in a city like Medellin, you can't get anywhere without the right credentials. As a result, neither of us were allowed any guests in our respective hostels. We thought on our feet and decided the night was warm enough for us to spend it in one of Medellin's public parks. So we spot what seemed like a nice enough place to lay down. Only, as we're walking over, we see these four Colombian guys hanging out on a bench. No reason to be suspicious right away, right? I mean, it was a nice enough night. And the South American idea of a late night is totally different to our own. Not everyone hanging out past midnight is some kind of reprobate or something. I suppose that goes for the States too, but I digress. So me and Steph are sitting there for a few minutes when one of the guys from the bench comes over to talk to us. My Spanish was still embarrassingly dire at that time, but I knew enough to know he was asking for a cigarette. I told him I didn't smoke, but he carried on asking for stuff like money, then other things with words I didn't quite understand. I kept telling him I didn't know what he was saying, but he just wouldn't give up. He kept on talking us, then spit out something mean-sounding in Steph's direction. At that point, I took issue. I have enough Dutch courage to tell him to get fucked before I led Steph off to another spot farther away from them. I'll spare you the finer details of what followed, but needless to say, Steph and I ended up having a little cuddle, shall we say, until we heard and saw something that almost scared us half to death, a police siren and flashing lights, just a few feet away, near the boundary of the park. Steph quickly pulled her dress back on, and we attempted to make ourselves as presentable as possible, as the cop car screeched to a stop. Two guys jumped out, and they came jogging over to us. How they knew we were there, I don't know, but I figured the guy asking for smokes had called them as a kind of screw you for not being generous sort of thing. I was on the verge of a full-on freakout. All I could think of now was how I was going to end up in a Colombian jail, and that would be the end of it for me. Colombia has some of the worst prisons in all of South America, and no offense to our Latin cousins, but that's really saying something. What's worse, I didn't have the money to pay a fine or a bribe, so there was zero chance of me talking my way out of it. Still, I didn't really have much of a choice. The best I could hope for was to pull off a speech skill 100 check, so I got down to it. As this little Colombian cop, I don't even say that to be mean, the guy was literally no bigger than 5 foot 4 or so, was shining his flashlight in my face, I was pouring out a string of bilingual apologetic consciousness. All the cop did was scold us in Spanish, talking so fast I couldn't even understand a word. Steph was welling up with tears at this point, as she too thought she was going to be arrested. All I could do was shut up and let the cop burn off whatever angry energy he had. I prayed he wouldn't just drag us off to jail then and there. I told him I couldn't understand, until he finally calmed down and pulled a smartphone out of his police vest. That's when I saw him pulling up Google Translate, and I knew something wasn't quite right here. If he was here to throw the cuffs on us, surely he'd have already done it, right? So, what was he about to type out? I'll never forget what came next, 
and how I foolishly tried to anticipate his words without stopping to consider the context. The first thing he typed was, these men, and pointed over to where the cigarette guy and his friends had been. I looked over, expecting to see them all looking smug, but no one was there any longer. It dawned on me that they'd beat feet as soon as they'd seen the cops arrive. I was about to say something like, yeah, I know they called you, I'm sorry, but the cop cut me off with a little sock puppet hand gesture. I watched him type further. These men are very dangerous. You need to leave now. They will come back. The cop stopped for a second, like he was trying to find the right word. They'll come back and they'll violate the girl, you understand? My chin was dusting the floor at this point. I had no idea we were in that much danger. Right before I could say anything else, the man typed once more. These people are known to us. They've done things before and they'll do them again. Again, we just nodded. Too stunned by how dumb I'd been to really be relieved that we weren't in any trouble. Don't come back here again during the night, no matter what. He showed us the message and escorted us to a well-lit street nearby. As you can imagine, that whole thing really killed the mood. And even though I walked Steph back to her hostel, there was never any talk of me getting inside to continue where we left off. I saw her a few more times before she moved on to Argentina. And yes, we did conclude some unfinished business, even kept in touch for a while after I returned to the US. But you can bet your bottom dollar I did not go anywhere near any poorly lit places in Medellin for the remainder of my stay. I learned my lesson, and I learned it real good. The scariest case I ever took on was when a woman in her 40s gave me a ring and told me she reckoned her husband bought it for a bit on the side. Those kinds of jobs are my bread and butter, so off I popped following this bloke around, trying to catch him out with his bit of crumpet while the wife's at home bathing the kids or something. About a week goes by and no matter how much I follow this guy around, he never seemed to do anything too dodgy or go anywhere remotely naughty. Actually, I was getting a bit frustrated when one afternoon after he finished work, he started driving out to the middle of bloody nowhere. All I could think was, I've got him now, don't I? Is one bit of unusual behavior, traveling out of town. This has got to be it. Only he didn't go out to some bloody travel lodge or something. He went right out to the beach, into this little boathouse hidden amongst some sand dunes. I'm thinking to myself, what the hell kind of place is this? What kind of bloke meets his bit of skirt in a place like this either? Either way, I grab my camera and start sneaking down toward the shack to get a picture of the two in action. I'm right up on the door edging it open, getting ready to snap a shot of this fellow's pale hairy bottom going up and down like the clappers when I feel something cold and metallic push against the back of my head. You the police? Someone asked. If I'd have said yes, there's no doubt in my mind that my brains would be splattered all over the inside of that boathouse because what felt like a piece of pipe was actually a single barrel 12 gauge. A proper old farmer's blunderbuss. I said, no, I'm not. I'm a private eye investigating things. Just shagging about. There was silence for a moment. Then he poked me in the back of the head with a barrel so hard it hurt. Get in the shack now. I go in and see there's all these black plastic packages in the hull of a small rowing boat. Drugs had to be the only reason he'd be willing to kill a copper. That big boy money, so to speak. The fella held me at gunpoint, made me strip down, went through all of my stuff making sure I was who I said I was. He was only satisfied when he saw my business card. He asked me again why I was following him, and I told him honestly, the missus reckons you're shagging about. Good God, my voice was quaking like you wouldn't believe. He took the gun off me and laughed to himself. Here's what's gonna happen, okay? You're gonna take this five grand off me, go back to my missus and tell her I'm not having an affair. You tell her I take long walks on the beach, tell her I'm going bird watching or something. You don't tell her the truth, got it? He kept one of my business cards to let me know he was deadly serious. You do any messing about, and there's people I work with that will come find you. I knew he was being deadly serious. Needless to say, getting paid twice for one job was great stuff. 
but thinking I was about to get my head blown off by a secret drug dealer in a hidden beachside boating hut, I can't say I'd recommend it to be honest. This happened at the end of summer in 2019. I, female, needed a distraction from my boring university revisions, and as lots of bored single people do, I hopped on Tinder. Nothing too serious, really. I was too busy to meet guys anyway. I simply liked talking to people. One day, I matched with a guy who will name Ted, who was in the same university as I was. He looked very handsome in his pictures. After talking for a few days on the app, and after I had wrongfully decided he was not a criminal, all the irony. I gave him my number. Again, we talked for a while, then he asked to call me. Nothing too exciting, just the usual getting to know each other. We talked on the phone for a couple of weeks. He called me at random hours of the day and almost every night. I didn't really think that much of it though. During our phone calls, he mostly talked about himself. I didn't really mind though because I didn't like talking much about me. It takes time before I trust anyone, and again, I was bored and a bit lonely. I'd been single for a while, so getting the attention felt quite nice. After a few weeks, Ted asked if I wanted to meet. I said yes because I'd finished with my exams. We met at the city center. When I saw him, I was kind of shocked. He looked nothing like the handsome guy in his pictures. It was definitely still him, you could tell, but good angles and Photoshop truly do make miracles is all I can say. I was a bit taken aback, but I'm not one to judge by looks anyway so I went on with the date. Thinking back now though, there were some obvious red flags I missed. He kept asking weird questions like, are you shy? Why won't you stare into my eyes? Well buddy, non-stop eye contact is really weird. I do need to take my eyes off you to pick up my beer from the table or light up a cigarette sometimes. The night went on and we'd had quite a few drinks. Usually I would never ask someone I just met to come home with me but I was wearing beer mojito vodka goggles that made my brain blind. We left and spent the night together. In the morning, I drove him to the train station and went back home to have a nap. At the end of the day, he called me and asked if we could meet again the next night. I wasn't really sure if I wanted to see him again though. I knew the only reason I'd brought him home was alcohol in the first place. We didn't really click at all on the date. The idea of rejecting him made me feel guilty though, so I agreed anyway. A day after that, he came to my place again, and there things started to get weird. I started to feel extremely nervous. Something was feeling really off. Thinking back, I think it was probably my guts telling me to get away from this guy. I decided to make things clear. I told him I was not looking for a serious relationship at all, at least not with him. I apologized and decided to bring him home. When we got in the car, he was quite angry. He didn't talk to me and I was embarrassed so I didn't talk either. We arrived, he got out and slammed the car door quite hard. I knew I had made quite a few mistakes here. I shouldn't have accepted another date with him knowing I was not into him and I should have told him sooner I didn't want a relationship. I sincerely did not mean to act so badly. That's why I tried to be honest with him as I could. The next day, I called him and apologized again. He said it was fine and we hung up. I thought that would be it but oh boy was that not. A few days later, it was time to get back to uni. That morning, I woke up to this gigantic message from him, telling me that the reaction I had a few nights before really threw him off, and he was looking for stability. As soon as I opened the text, he called me. It was 7 in the morning and I'd just woken up, so I couldn't really understand what he was saying. I simply told him again I didn't want to go any further with our relationship. He hung up and for the next few weeks, things got even weirder. He started following me everywhere on campus, very obviously hiding behind walls to hear my conversations, texting me all hours of the day, even if I was not replying. Calling me 20 times a day even. I thought he was creepy, but that maybe he was hurt and was just coping. Ted was always with a guy we'll call Elliot as well. When I was at the library, they were always sitting together near to where I was, Ted was always watching me as I would study. When I went out for a break, he would follow me. It came to the point where my friends were texting me to warn me he was right behind me. I tried avoiding him, but it was useless. 
I told him many, many times I did not want any more contact with him and he was making me uncomfortable, but nothing worked. He just kept going on and I was going crazy. Two weeks later, I was at a party where I met my now boyfriend. I fell in love very quickly. He's the most caring, loving man I've ever met. It's all lovey-dovey, yes, try not to puke on your keyboard. Anyway, in that moment, I knew I needed to put my foot down and stop being so acceptant of Ted's behavior. I explained to him one last time to stop contacting me and finally blocked him. I truly thought it would be over now. He continued to follow me everywhere on campus, though, except he was not with Elliot anymore. One day, I was studying in the library. Ted was a few tables away from me, of course, when suddenly someone sat at the table in front of mine. It was Elliot. I looked at Ted and he was glaring at Elliot with the most murderous gaze ever. I thought it was weird. I had never spoken to Elliot before and he never came near me at all either. I was creeped out. I thought maybe Ted had sent him to talk to me or something. But instead, Elliot just ignored me and I kept on studying. When I went outside for a cigarette, he also blocked Ted from following me. I was a bit surprised but I didn't think much of it. A few moments later, Ted went outside. Elliot turned his head and watched him till he was out of sight. Then he turned to me and spoke in a hurry. Hey, I really need to talk to you, okay? I think you're in some danger. I'm sorry, I know it's weird because we don't really know each other, but I'm really worried for you. I was stunned. I didn't know what to say. We don't have a lot of time before he comes back. When you went out, he came yelling at me because I sat in front of you. When he leaves, we need to talk some more, okay? I said yes, and I was shaking. At around 6 p.m., Ted finally left after watching me the whole day. We waited another hour to make sure he was gone. We didn't want him to know we were in contact with each other. At 7 p.m., we sat down in the cafeteria, and Elliot told me things that made me shiver. He explained that Ted had had really horrible discourses about women and how he would love to control them. He also explained that a few weeks prior, he'd started to have suspicions about Ted's behavior regarding university classes. He followed random classes every week, sometimes even showed up at Elliot's classes, although he did not follow them, and he didn't seem to have access to the university online platforms either. Elliot did a bit more digging and realized that his friend did not have a university email address, which every member of the university was supposed to have. Elliot went to the administration and they confirmed what he'd suspected. Ted was not a student. He never was. After that, Elliot completely cut off contact with him. Since then, Ted was harassing him, calling and texting him all the time, following him everywhere. Elliot was shaking as he was telling me this story. I was shaken up as well. But what was coming would reveal itself to be even worse. Elliot explained he absolutely needed to warn me, because Ted had started saying some really terrifying things about me specifically. I wanted to cry. Ted was talking about me all the time. Shortly before Elliot cut contact, it got to the point where Ted was making very detailed plans about how he was going to rear me. That he knew where I lived. That he could come whenever he wanted and get me by surprise. He even knew where I parked my car on campus, and he wanted to wait for me in the dark. He always said it with this joking tone but Elliot got real freaked out. I had tears in my eyes. I knew Ted was a creep, but I could have never imagined it was that bad. At this point, we were near the end of the semester, but we still had a few weeks left. Elliot and I decided to take action because we didn't want to be terrified every time we were on campus. First things first, we contacted university security. Things were taken extremely seriously. One morning when I arrived, the walls were completely covered with posters with a campus emergency number. Elliot and I began constant contact with the chief of security, who was very concerned for our safety. They managed to catch Ted at the library and asked him not to come again. We also went to the police. I don't know the right term for it, but we didn't file a complaint exactly. The police added a note to his record so that if anything happened to us, the police would know what we were worried about in the first place. The officers seemed worried as well. I asked him why. He told me he wasn't allowed to say anything specific, but if I ever saw Ted outside of campus, I needed to call the police without hesitation. How reassuring was that? A few days later, I got a voicemail from Elliot. Told me that he knows things he was not supposed to know. Apparently, Ted is mentally sick. He's regularly arrested and locked in mental hospitals. 
drug addict, alcoholic, has violent tendencies, was already accused of attempted irp. He lived off invalidity insurance, which explains why he had so much time on his hands to come to university. I would have never guessed that when I met him initially. Later, I contacted one of my acquaintances who works closely with the police. They weren't supposed to, but they confirmed everything. Sent chills down my spine. After that, things calmed down. Ted was still somehow managing to skulk about campus, but he kept a low profile instead. He stopped following us. It was finally the end of the semester. I went away for a few weeks and never set a foot on the campus. I felt a bit relieved. When spring semester started though, Ted was somehow still there. Not following any longer, but always watching closely. I was so freaked out. Then, COVID hit fortunately. Since then, all courses are online, and I've not seen Ted again. I don't know if he's still creeping on people or if he's now officially a student or what. When I think of him, I'm still shaky. I hope I never run into him again. So I'm not gonna lie, I sell weed. Because I have a car, sometimes I make deliveries for people who live a little bit further away. A couple of weeks ago, one of my homies needed a sack for himself and a friend of his. I've known this dude for 15 plus years now, so if he says his friend is cool, then I'm cool too. Setting up the sack he wanted and some supplies of my other strains for the buddy, I set out on the 30 minute drive to the south side of my city. Now, I'm not a small woman by any means. I'm 5 foot 6 and weigh 200 pounds of thick muscle. I also carry a 380 on my hip at all times, so I'm not really someone people tend to mess about with. When I arrived at my homie's house, we had our introductions, smoked a blunt, and I started sharing my samples with the new guy. He seemed alright at first. He was polite, made eye contact, didn't fidget too much. My homie said he had to make a phone call and stepped outside. Sounded like he was having some sort of spat with his old lady. The friend and I sparked up the blunt again as we discussed pricing and such for the different buds. Then, out of nowhere, he said this. Do you know how dangerous it is for a woman to sell drugs? I stared at him blankly. What the fuck had possessed him to just randomly say that? I shrugged, not really knowing how to respond. Seems like it would be real easy for someone to rob you. And do some other things, too. His voice dripped with something I'd never heard before. Malice, perhaps? This dude was making me feel real nervous, making me cross my legs and drop my hand to my side. I started looking out the window, wondering where my friend was. Oh, he's gonna be a while now. She caught him cheating or something and now they're fighting about shit. So, how'd you get into this game? His words seemed genuine once more. The malice I sensed earlier had abated somewhat, so I answered him honestly. Kids, bills, usual story. I began to nervously tap my finger, waiting for my friend to come back in. When he reached out and grabbed a hold of my leg, not in like the gentle caress you would do if you were making advances either, but a tight squeeze on my knee so tight, it made me gasp in pain and left heavy bruises. You know, I should just take you out back and leave you in the desert. No one would ever know. The dude was fucking threatening me now. Everyone thinks they'll act in a certain way in certain situations. I mean, hell, the whole reason I carry a gun is to protect myself. But I was suddenly frozen in a state of shock. Before either of us could say another thing, my friend threw open the door in a huff. A sigh of relief escaped my lips as the guy released his grip on my knee. I quickly ran to my feet, grabbing my bag and the samples from the table, murmuring about how I had to run. Without even making sure I'd gotten the money for the sack, I booked it to my truck, threw it in reverse, and sped out of there as fast as my truck would allow me. I sprayed rocks behind the tires as I peeled out of that gravel driveway. I haven't been back to see that friend since. I've been dodging his phone calls and visits. I don't need his money that bad. 15 plus years thrown away, just because he had bad taste in other people. <laughs>